much for uh, coming to our historic First Parish meeting, uh, House in, in Bitterford, Maine. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little rundown of that as my obligation as, as president. I uh, would like to uh, recognize my friend Dan Peck back here, who was president uh, previous to me. And one of the reasons why this building looks the way it does is because of him. He was able to, uh, I don't know, twist arms and elbows and, and convince people that this was a good place to um, store or keep up the park, as he said. And uh, the paint looks great. The uh, structure is in good shape. And we have other plans also uh, for this building is to maybe add some type of electric safe furnace instead of that thing back there that scares the hell out of me every time we come in in the wintertime or close to it. So um, that's something that's going to be taking place. But other than that, uh, just a little bit about the meeting house. This meeting house was built in 1840. If you notice, there's a, a, a writing on the outside that mentions that the first parish meeting house was constructed in 1759. There were actually meeting houses here in Biddeford before that. Biddeford was established in 1630 uh, it was by Richard Vines, uh, who was an Anglican. And, uh, and you probably know if you study history that there was a great squabble going on in England and across Europe in terms of the proper methods and ways in which we were supposed to uh, pay tribute to Jesus Christ. And uh, it was uh, all sorts of different ways and methods. And then, of course, each one thought that this was the only way we should do it. Uh, and the Puritans were probably the most evidentiary in terms of their strictness. Uh, this building is a really excellent example of the uh, uh, Puritan style. It's simple, there's no stained glass, there's no statues. All there was was King James Bible, and then the first, one of the first uh, ministers here was a man named Jenner. And he and the Anglican got into an argument, and that particular founding father, Richard Vines, Vines Lane, you've probably heard of, he booted out of here in 1642, went down to Barbados, and opened up a, or purchased a sugarcane plantation. Uh, established our connection to the whole slave thing. We had a, a presentation the other night, which was really fascinating. Um, from that time on, there were meeting houses that popped up. And according to the province of Massachusetts, of which Maine was a part of, they uh, demanded that each community or center would have a meeting house. The meeting house was set up for two reasons, civil, and religious. So it wasn't just religion that was being uh, preached or parked or whatever presented. It was also courts and government meetings. Uh, by 1776, you don't know that thing, that year, by the hustle bustle before the American Revolution, it was here where James Sullivan met with other members, founding members of Bitterford, and they addressed the people of York County. And I don't know how many people were out there, and it was never been. I, I checked the records at our library. I'm not sure. But I do know that there were many people out here on that street. And they read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it was chilling, because they knew now they had cut their ties. Um, in 1840, this building replaced the original one. The original one had two stories. It had a steeple, and this was even much more, much simpler and useful. The pews, these were for home by families. They pay a rent every year. And, uh, and some of them on the kneelers, underneath the kneeler, are the names of the people who were here. That item right there was a gift from a person who was a family, family member here. Their family were members here for years and years. And uh, they gave that in 1892. And we had a lady in, uh, who played that uh, a few weeks ago, and it was just awesome. And that word awesome was what we used, but it was awesome. And, and uh, the lady who sang was the same. It was incredible. And I'm sure that the spirits that hang out here, you know, and those, those souls that are out and around must have really appreciated it. There's a lot of smiling faces and so forth. So tonight, we have as our guest 
uh, speaker and presenter on behalf of the Mitchell Historical Society and Rockford Library. I'd like to welcome you to the first parish meeting house here from Maine, uh, the second oldest meeting house, remember that now because I'm going to ask you later, from the Puritan era of our colonial history. Richard Parsons taught history and English for 30 years in public school before joining the staff of the Institute for Learning Technologies at Columbia University in New York City. There he worked with others to digitize resources held by Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt at the Institute and the Library of Congress, among others, to make them available to scholars and educators. Later, as a member of the Center for Technology and School Change at Columbia University, Teachers College, he worked with pre-service and in-service teachers to bring more effective uses of technology into the public school classroom. Today he resides on the coast in southern Maine, where he gazes across the bay at the Wood Island Lighthouse nearly every day. That's not a bad thing to look at. He has joined with others who have devoted their energies to the restoration of the American historic treasures and serves as historian and member of the executive board of the Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse. He lives in Saco with his wife, Sherry Robinson, and his dog, Donner. Copies of the Wood Island Lighthouse, Stories from the Edge of the Sea, published by History Press, Press will be available for purchase from Elements. It's a coffee shop in Bitter across from Catholic Library. It's an awesome place. Right? It really is. It's a great place. Just go in and meet people. Uh, so, I know as a teacher myself, for 30 years in the public school system here, and teaching me in local history, I always found everything. Every time I would go somewhere, you could something new and find out. And I'm really interested in hearing what Richard has to say. But I believe that you know history is taught on a general level, and then it goes down into microcosms. We hit another microcosm. We've gone from the span of old Bitterford uh, to History of Bitterford Pool by Margot Alley. And now we have Wood Island, uh, Wood Island Light. Uh, and I think that's just fantastic. So, Richard Parsons, thank you. For thank you. Um, you could have just said I was a teacher and left it at that. <laughs> um, it's awesome. <laughs> to, be, to be here um, inside this building with spirits of people whose name was Hill, Tarbox, people whose association with the history of Biddeford is certainly well known, but they also had a direct relationship um, with the Wood Island Lighthouse. And so I'm hoping that if they're listening to this, that they are in agreement with the things that I'm about to tell you which really is going to revolve around three of the stories that come from the book. This one is the uh, presentation I'm going to call Three Stories from the Edge of the Sea, Dogs, Bells, and a Presidential Yacht. Uh, but before we launch into those stories, I wanted to give you a little bit of an orientation. We just spent the last couple of days at the Loch Kermess Festival in Bitford, and people coming by our little table there, it was always surprising to me how few of them actually knew that there was a, a lighthouse out there. And they didn't know that it was called the Wood Island Lighthouse. So I wanted to start off by um, just sort of giving you a little bit of a geographical orientation and then maybe a historical orientation as well. Um, and it also, as a kind of a history nerd, gives me a chance to show you this great chart that was made by Samuel de Champlain in 1605. Think about that, 1605. And he still got it right. The depths, and there's Basket Island, Stage Island, and here's Wood Island. And the Wood Island Lighthouse is right at the edge. Island right there. Um, this is the first image that we have of the Wood Island Lighthouse. It's uh, 1859. By that time, the lighthouse had changed a couple of times. Um, it, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, that the tower is made of stone. The original tower was wood. 
and it deteriorated rather quickly, uh, resulting in the need to redo the whole thing in 1838. I also wanted to show you the barn here in a little henry that indicates that these lighthouse keepers were as much farmers as they were lighthouse keepers. <laughs> this um, is about 30 years later. The lighthouse is, is a little bit bigger. It's a story and a half now. I want to draw your attention to this triangular pyr pyramidal shape building, which was a bell tower, which was added in 1873. Um, and this is uh, likely Keeper Orcutt with his famous dog, Sailor. Another view of the same era, just from a different <coughs> perspective. This is 1909 or thereabouts, I'm guessing because of the age of the twins here. They were born in 1907 or 1908, looked to be about maybe a year and a half, two years old. Um, the structure that exists on the island today was restored to look like this. Um, two stories, Dutch colonial dwelling, very good view of the pyramidal bell tower here. Um, and if you go out there, which I hope that you will, you'll see that the lighthouse looks very much like this. It does not have this tool shed and the bell tower has long since disappeared. But the dwelling and the tower were pretty much the same. And if you do go out there, you can go through the dwelling and you can go up to the top of the tower, one of the few lighthouses in the main that will allow you to do that. A little bit later in the 1930s, and the reason I wanted to show you that is to point out this little thing right here, which is the bell. The original bell, which I'll talk about in a little while, um, was replaced in 1890, and here it's sitting in the yard of the, of the lighthouse keeper. In 1937, there was an effort to change the look of the lighthouse, and the uh, keeper at the time, Earl Benson, changed the uh, front porch into a sun porch, walled it all in. This uh, just shows the the uh, period under construction. But here you can see the result. It no longer has those pillars out there, and the sun porch is fairly um, visible. The other thing I wanted to point out here is that the top got taken off. We call this the headless light tower period. <laughs> um, the, the, the light was replaced in the 19, early 1970s by an arrow beacon. Nobody thought that that looked very good, so the Coast Guard did replace the lantern up here uh, with a fabricated, not the original, but with a fabricated lantern room so that it looks a lot more like a lighthouse than it did when it was headless. But so by 1992, the lighthouse had begun to deteriorate. In, 18, in 1986, all the lighthouses, by then, all the lighthouses had been automated. There was no longer a need for a keeper out there. The uh, result was that these places began to fall apart. Um, and they needed attention. And that attention was um, obtained by the American Lighthouse Federation when it, you know, it was notified the country that Wood Island was on the doomsday list, and here you can see that it's beginning to crumble. So in 2003, uh, a group of, uh, of folks got together and formed the Friends of the Wood Island Lighthouse. Um, they decided that they wanted the lighthouse to look like it did in 1906. Um, here's an image probably from 19, uh, 2011 showing the lighthouse under construction. And if you go out there today, this is the way that it looks. It's a wonderful trip, wonderful tour. And um, if you haven't been out there recently, you should definitely make the trip. I don't see the windows in that picture. It's sort of, Sorry? I don't see the windows or the, 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 the divisions of the... In the tower? The, yeah, the, the, the house, there's no... Well, I think they're there. Yeah. 
Okay, so now it's time for your first quiz. Remember, I am a teacher, and so here we go. Your job is to look at this image and to think of a caption that would be appropriate. <laughs> his dog. <laughs> <laughs> I intentionally chose this cartoon um, because I think that it shows the affection that lighthouse keepers had for their pets. Am I right, Russ? <laughs> this actually came from Russ's collection of photographs and other artifacts that he gave to us. And among those, um, in just a second, I'll show you some other images. But the first story that I want to talk to you about is the story of a sailor. I call it, we call him the dog that rang the bell. But first, I want to tell you a couple of short stories. Um, these are Russ's dogs. And correct me if I get them wrong, but let's see. I think that, uh, that up here we see Boo Boo, uh, Maggie May. Kelly, did I leave one out? Yogi. And Yogi. Did I have all of I think this is Kelly, I believe. And Kelly has a story of her own. She was a, a, a real lighthouse dog. She went out there in 1970 or thereabouts and would not leave the island. So she was there to greet keepers as they came and went and lived out there for her. 12 years at least, uh, I know that Russ had, a, had her, was it, was she, was she? Um, another short story is the story of Tammy Burnham and her dog Squeaky. Tammy's father, Keeper Burnham, decided that he needed to go to Biddeford Pool, hopped in his pea pod, went out there, but unbeknownst to him, was followed by Squeaky, who couldn't stand to have the keeper leave her behind. So she swam all the way to Biddeford Pool. Wow. Keeper Burnham got to Biddeford Pool, went about whatever business he was doing, got back in his boat, and then came back to the island, leaving Squeaky behind. Well, <coughs> Squeaky's not a stupid dog. She decided, well, I'm not going to make that swim again. So the happy ending to this story is that somebody recognized that Squeaky was had been left behind, contacted Keeper Burnham, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> this is Keeper Roach with his son Jimmy, and the way they passed their winters, apparently at least part of it, was to hook up their dog Rusty and use him as a sled dog. <laughs> and so Rusty would haul the little, the, the younger son, sorry, up, uh, oops, Jimmy, um, around the island as if he were the Iditarod or something. But I wanted to show you this picture for a different reason. Um, Jimmy became kind of famous for some other reasons. I'm going to let her, his mother tell you this story. His mother was named Catherine Roach, and here's the way she tells the story. Well, I had two dogs, she said, four-legged dogs. He kept saying to me, meaning Jimmy, oh, mom, hurry up breakfast, hurry up, hurry up. We have to go play with the black doggy. Jim, we don't have a black dog, Catherine said, we have two brown dogs. And he would say, no, 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 we have a black dog and it swims here every day and plays with us. I said, where does it play with you? He says, oh, over there, by the bell. And I said, Jim, we do not have a black dog. And he says, yes, we do, mom, yes, we do. But he only has two legs. Ma has back legs. I go, Jim, we don't have a seal. We don't have a black dog. He argued and argued. It took a couple of weeks before I got to see it myself. But, our, but they played every day. I couldn't understand why the dogs were just so worn out. They would come in after an hour and just collapse. Yep, the seal was just another dog that swam up out of the water. <laughs> So I thought that was the end of the story, 
But it turns out that the keeper prior to the roaches um, had met the seal as well. Um, his name was Keeper Alfred Savageau, and his son was named Rick. Remember Rick. But Keeper Savageau, like Keeper Burnham, went to Biddeford Pool, left his boat behind, did his shopping, and came back and found the seal in his boat. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that it was a young seal and hoping that maybe he could find the mother, he went around the harbor looking for the seal's mom, could not find it, so went back to the island and let the seal go with his fingers crossed, hoping that the seal would eventually find its mother. Well, the seal decided that Keeper Savageau was going to be its mother, I guess, mm -hmm. because the seal kept coming back and coming back. So this, I believe, although I don't have any really strong evidence for it, was the same seal that remained behind when the Savageau was left, and um, Jimmy Roach <clears throat> thought it was a black dog. <laughs> but the real dog story, uh, <laughs> real pet story, is about Sailor. Um, probably many of you know about Sailor, but let me just briefly tell you that Sailor came to the island in 1890 as a two-month-old puppy. Um, his, his master was Keeper Thomas Orchid, and the keeper was actually getting the puppy to be companion to his two youngest children. But Sailor decided that no, he was not going to have anything to do with a bunch of the young kids. He wanted to be Orcutt's dog. And so he followed Orcutt all over the island. And over the course of a couple of years, gradually learned how to ring the bell. He became famous that way. Um, in fact, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, his fame was far and wide, but recognized not only in Biddeford, in Biddeford papers, but was also, we also found articles about him in Wisconsin, in Kansas, in the Atlanta Constitution, and in a London Illustrated magazine. Here's Sailor ringing the bell. A little blurry, but you get the idea. And here he is again with Keeper Orchid. Well, he became very dependable, so it was worrisome when this happened. This is the story about, Ke about Sailor, told by the Keeper's son, George. He says, the dog was gone several minutes, and my father, not hearing the bell, which never failed to ring, started to go and see what was the matter. He had not reached the door before Sailor was upon him, looking up at him in mute appeal. I happened to be in the room and heard and saw what occurred. Sailor, said my father, reaching for a stick in the corner. If you don't go and ring that bell this minute, I will whip you. My father shook the whip in the sailor's face as he spoke, and the dog slunk off down toward the station with his tail between his legs. Father had more than returned the stick to the corner before the dog was back again. This time, Sailor hung his head and would not look up until my father had again reached for the stick when he went away as before. We were wondering what could have happened to poor Sailor that he could have so lost his wits, when all at once we heard him at the door whining to be let in again. My father left his chair and what do you suppose we saw? There was Sailor, looking as if he had lost his best friend and holding a broken bell rope between his teeth. The rope had been parted in some way during the previous night, and this was the way Sailor had of informing him. Now if you look really carefully, it looks like this is a rope that has been repaired there, or else frayed. I'm not sure if this is the rope that actually got parted or if it's just another rope. But I like to think that maybe this was the actual rope. So Sailor became so famous, in fact, that he got his own obituary when he eventually died. And not only that, but there were poems written about him. And so bear with me. I'm going to read you a poem by Waldo Stilson Barrow, who was the nephew of one of the keepers out there and the grandson of another keeper. Poor Sailor was a faithful dog. On yonder isle of wood, through many years of rain and fog nearby, his duty stood. And rang the bell when passing boats too near the breakers came, until they heard its warning notes, the dog, now known to fame. For he was oft times photographed, as he would ring the bell, by some white-winged pleasure craft out sailing on the swell. 
Sailor salutes were often heard by fishers passing by, and friends were made and hearts were stirred, but sailor had to die. But faithful master's noble dog, but, and none could him excel, for 15 years in storm and fog when asked, he'd ring the bell. Sailor was glad when strangers came and seemed to love them well, kindly disposed to all the same the dog that rang the bell. No more will hear his joyous bark as he would rush pell mell, so full of sport and gaze a lark when he would ring the bell. But this we'll miss a long, long while, and off the story tell of the faithful dog that wooded eye of the dog that rang the bell. And when he we sail the lighthouse by and roll an ocean swell, we'll think of sailor, the noble dog, the dog that rang the bell. Our, with our island friends, we sympathize to whom this loss befell. For sailors gone, the pet so wise, the dog that rang the bell. <laughs> Wonderful form. <laughs> but that brings us to the second story. The second story is the story of the traveling bell. Now, if you recall, I asked you to remember Rick Savageau, the little boy with the seal and the. He came out to the island in 2011. Um, and here is, is his picture at Vines Landing, standing next to the traveling bell. But the story that we're about to hear is the story of how that bell got there in the first place. By the way, Rick would not be allowed to go out to the island because he's not wearing shoes that were appropriate to get onto the boat. First of all, the bell almost never happened. I came across these notes, really, in the Union and Journal going back to 1870. And in July, the first note says there is a probability that a steam whistle will soon be placed on Wood Island at the mouth of the Saco River. So prior to bells and so forth, um, Keepers used to use all sorts of contrivances as in an effort to warn ships of, uh, during foggy times. They would shoot off a cannon. They would get out there and bang against just about anything. Well, apparently God decided that maybe a steam whistle would be a good idea on Wood Island. But then less than six months later, um, I found this second article. Last Friday, Mrs. Horace Bacon, accompanied by a young lady, was driving in a sleigh down Granite Street when the horse became frightened by the steam whistle on Gooch's ledge and was rendered unmanageable. He dashed down the street and coming in contact with the fence near the junction of Granite and Cottage Streets, he threw both of the ladies out and smashed the sleigh. The ladies were but little injured and I can tell you that the horse was okay too, but it may have been enough of an accident to convince folks at the, at the island that maybe they should rethink the idea of a steam whistle. By the way, I just went by this place and there's another street right next to Granite Street and Cottage Street called Fall Street. So I've often wondered if maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> now I don't know. So finally, in 1873, the, uh, a bell did finally make it to the island. It was um, made in Sheffield, England, where he weighed over 5, uh, 1,300 pounds. And here we learn that um, the bell was to be rung by machinery operated, located in a pyramid-shaped building between the lighthouse and the water. The bell strikes every 15 seconds, or rather, it says, it strikes once, and then after 15 seconds, strikes twice. So there was a bell out there, it was not a steam whistle, and this is what the bell tower looks like up close got a sense of what it was like when Sailor was ringing the bell, but this is the bell tower. But that bell, unfortunately, didn't last very long. It was, um, I think, 17 years before it began to rust and deteriorate and had to be replaced. So in 1890, they took the original bell out of the bell tower and placed it on the ground. And if you really look carefully, barely see the bell here has been turned upside down and is being used as a flower pot in the, <laughs> the, the yard of Keeper Burke. A few years later, the bell apparently didn't work out very well as a flower pot, and so they transfer, transferred it 
over to the side of the yard, but presumably just to get it out of the way. Eventually, it migrated closer to the edge of the sea. And here's Pat Winchester in 1964, sitting on the bell. Just, I guess they just wanted to get it out of the way. And in, by 1976, you can see how precariously it's sitting on the edge of the, the property there. It was at that moment that two men, Jerry Murray and Marshall Alexander, decided that they wanted to save that bell. And Marshall Alexander got, apparently got permission from the Coast Guard, who hadn't paid any attention to the bell for all of these years, uh, to transfer the bell back to the mainland, uh, where he hoped to use it as a tribute to his father in some way. So here's an image of the bell being trans transferred to the one end of the island to the other. And again, I think this is Kelly here, helping out. <laughs> Curiously, once they got that bell to the mainland, the Coast Guard decided that they maybe made a mistake in letting people have control over it. And so they got an offer from Delaware, from a museum in Delaware for this bell, and the Coast Guard said, sure, yeah, you can have it, probably for a fee. Um, but luckily, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to tell this story, because the Biddeford Historical Society intervened. They got in contact with their state senator, who's named Elmont Tyndale, their U.S. senator, Edmund Muskie, and a, a senator from Ohio, Robert Taft. And together, they combined and put some political pressure, apparently, on the Coast Guard, and it was a very timely um, situation, the bell was transferred from Biddeford Pool to Portland, was going to be transferred from there to Delaware the following day, when all of a sudden somebody put up their hands and said, nope, you're not going to take it to Delaware, we're going to send it back to Biddeford Pool. And sure, was, uh, sure enough, they did. The bell, bell, sorry, the bell wound up at the Union Church in 1976 in November. This is the letter that uh, confirms that. Um, and after about 25 years, it was taken from the new church to the Vines Landing, where it exists now. Before I go to the third story, though, I want to tell you a little bit of an irony. If you recall, and those of you that are history nerds like I am, well, remember that that bell got replaced in 1890. Remember, it got it deteriorated. You might also remember that Sailor was brought out to the island in 1890 as a two-month-old pup. So in spite of the entreaties by these various political um, folks, uh, calling on the sentimental value of the bell and the fact that it had become so famous because of the dog, this was not the bell. That, that sailor was rigged. Um, we'll just keep that as our little secret. <laughs> and uh, before we go on to this, the Wood Island Fog Bell cast of Sheffield Steel in England in 1872 became somewhat famous in the 1880s and 1890s when, Wood Island, when the Wood Island Lighthouse was staffed by a full-time lighthouse keeper. The lighthouse keeper at the time, Thomas Henry Orchid, had a dog on the island named Sailor. That dog somehow got the idea to ring the bell. It would grab the rope in its teeth and pull it to make the bell ring. He got to be such a well-known, it got to be such a well-known thing um, that the captains of uh, coastal steamers would pass will pass close to the island and salute with a blast from their whistle, and the passengers uh, could see the dog ring the bell. Um, so the story at the time was that this was a bell, this was the bell that Sailor was ringing, but it really was. But then there's a, a, a still another connection here that I want to remember. One of the senators was named Robert Taft, and he was from Ohio. 
Now, why would Robert Taft in Ohio care about a bell in Biddeford? Well, Robert Taft was the grandson of William Howard Taft. Now, William Howard Taft um, was married to a, a, a woman named Helen Heron, and she had a sister who lived in Biddeford Pool in a cottage. So when William Howard Taft became president, people in Biddeford Pool and Biddeford in general, and Sockle too, hoped that the president would come and pay them a visit. Um, and indeed that did happen. It was not uncommon really to see the presidential yacht passing in front of the lighthouse. We have several log, log book entries that suggest that the steamer Mayflower, which was not this particular presidential yacht, but the, the larger presidential yacht, passed um, east at 930, probably carrying Theodore Roosevelt in 1908. But in 1909, the keeper wrote that the USS Mayflower passed in harbor at 2.30 p.m. The president tapped on board. That was in 1910. But I want to tell you a story about uh, that happened in 1909. In 1909, William Howard Taft was inaugurated in March, and a couple of months later, his wife suffered a stroke. When she suffered a stroke, her sister, who lived in Biddeford Pool, went to Washington, D.C. to nurse her sister back to health as best she could, um, and to be on the arm, as they say, of the president as he attended a ver various functions. Well, by July, uh, the, the president's sister-in-law was ready to return to Biddeford Pool. And he said, well, why don't you take my yacht? His yacht was called the Silt. It was not the largest of the presidential yachts, but it was certainly a pretty impressive thing. And indeed, the presidential yacht anchored in Wood Island Harbor. Well, that created quite a stir in Biddeford and Saco. People wanted to go out and see it. And among those people was a group of women working in the mill called, they were in the quilling department. And they chartered, chartered this little launch called the Item. And sure enough, on July 30th in 1909, 29 passengers, many of them from that quilling department, but there were some others, including three baseball players from the Biddeford baseball team. Um, hopped on board the launch and um, went down uh, went down the Saco River, intending to get a close-up view of the silt. There were 31 in all, if we include the um, captain and his crew. So the plan was to sail down the Saco River, out into the harbor. The silt was anchored right about here, and then they would return back up the river, have a good time. Well. Everything went swimmingly, as they say. They were having a grand old time. Reports, that, reports were that they were having a party on board, that they were singing and were having a, a jolly time. But as they left the, the river and, and began to enter the harbor or the, um, the bay here, they were struck by a swell, which caused the sill of the um, item to lean over a bit and alarm some of the passengers. The captain said, it's OK, just be calm, stay seated, and we'll be fine. So they continued on out, and they did indeed pass close to the sill. Um, and they were having such a good time that they decided that they would go out and around Wood Island, and come back, and pass between Wood Island, or between Stage Island and Basket Island, as they went, as they returned to the Sapo River. Well, as they returned through this passage, they evidently encountered a couple more of those swells. And the uh, passengers became somewhat overwrought um, and dashed to one side of the boat, which caused it to flip. In fact, so it flipped twice, turning the turtle so it was upside down. Now, women in those days wore all kinds of heavy skirts. Many of them were in the cabin, and they were trapped inside. Um, the three baseball players were heroic in that in their efforts to make um, to make um, life saving um, to save lives. Um, but in spite of their efforts, two girls were drowned. 
One of them was named Mrs. Uh, Eleanor Cutts. And she, she had been so bruised and battered in the cabin that they had to take her immediately to Goldthwaite's restaurant um, in Biddeford Pool, where she was nursed for the rest of that evening and the next day before she finally died. They couldn't find Catherine Lynch, um, who had also been lost. Um, and they searched and searched, and eventually, when they brought the the upturned boat back to Basket Island, and one of the rescuers was looking through the various um, articles in there to try to save any personal property that they could, they discovered her body in there. So Catherine Lynch uh, passed away as well. Meantime, sometime around midnight, uh, the, a relative of Margaret Harvey called and said she had not returned, and they Return, they sent rescue boats out back uh, out once again, searching for Margaret Harvey. They never really found her, at least not for two weeks, until her body eventually washed up on the shore. <clears throat> it was a terrible disaster, and one that I'm surprised that so few people know about. A presidential yacht, three deaths, some heroic actions, and it seems to have disappeared um, in history. And I think that we need to keep these and other stories like, um, available. But that story doesn't end there. Unlike today, a, a, a coroner's inquest was convened almost immediately. They investigated the crash, or the crash, they investigated the, the incident and found that the boat was unstable, easily capsized, and entirely unfit to carry passengers. And they went on to say that nothing further needs to be done. But can you imagine what would happen today if this incident occurred? The lawsuits would be flying back and forth and millions of dollars would be exchanging hands. Um, so maybe that's why we don't know very much about it. Not least it just, they just put it aside after declaring that the boat itself was unfit. Well, you've rescued people from the item. You've chased sailor around the island. Um, you've done more than your share of work. So I'm just going to suggest that we join Russell <laughs> Here, there's his son Zachary and dog Kelly. Go home and take it. <laughs> oh, that's boo boo. Boo boo. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I think it did say that I would answer some questions if you have them. Not that I know the answers, but I'd be happy to hear them. Yeah? What happens to the, late, the bell that replaced the original? Good story, good question, and there is no story that I can tell you of with a happy ending on that. The, it's 1972, I believe it was, a buoy tender pulled the bell tower over and I presume the bell was inside the bell tower when they pulled it over, and they just, I mean, they just deep-sixed everything. I don't know if the bell is still out there. There are some stories that somebody recovered the bell and it's somewhere, but it's frustrating because I would love to have that bell, and I, or at least know where it is, and I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know who cast that second bell? I don't. It looks like the first one was a Sheffield Naylor Vickers bell. It was. For, yeah. Yes, it was. In fact, it says right on it. I've had some of them. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if somebody wanted to go out and see the lighthouse today, how would they go about doing that? Well, funny that you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to the website um, and um, make a reservation on the web website. The boat goes out four times a week. There are three trips every day. Amy, keep me honest on this one. Um, 
They fill up pretty quickly. We can only take 13 passengers on each trip. Um, but it's a wonderful trip. And the only way to really get out there on the boat is to make a reservation online. Thank you. <coughs> www.woodislandlighthouse.org. I should have that up here. Oh, sorry, I was up Question? Another question? Yeah. Uh, just related to Wood Island, right next to it is a little place called Negro Island. Yes. Uh, any anecdotes about that? Why was it named that? <laughs> um, all I can tell you is that has, it has been named Negro Island since 1794. That's well before the Underground Railroad, well before any, um, well, it, it's, and the, I don't have any, I, all I can tell you is that I have been trying as hard as I can to try to figure out how it got its name, and I don't know. One theory, and that's all it is, is, and this has been told to me by some old salt, so take it with a grain of salt, um, is that captains of vessels would drop off their African American sailors or crew members on the way into Saco and Biddeford for fear that those crew members might be um, nabbed as escaped slaves, or that they might be subjected to discrimination, um, and so forth. I don't know if that's true, and uh, I have not found any evidence, and I keep asking people if they've ever heard of any such thing, and nobody said that, so I just don't know. Um, the other anecdote is that there is, uh, there is in uh, Maine, a law that against having offensive, na uh, offensive names. Uh, there are two Negro islands in Castine who are, which are in the process of being renamed. Um, and there is a small group of folks in our town that are looking into this Negro island to see um, whether or not it should be renamed. So. Could it be that uh, the island is constructed in baseball block? I've never heard that, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, were bell towers typically designed in those pyramids? They just look so out of sort of the style of the <laughs> thing. Is that the only one? Or were no, no, no. There, there were a lot of pyramid shaped bell towers. And the reason was that the striking machine that was inside required. It was a, a clockwork type machine, and so you had to wind it up, and it required a very high um, apex in order to, for the rope to go all the way up and the weight to start coming back down. So it would take about 10, 10 minutes, I think, to wind the thing up, 10 to 15 minutes, and the bell would strike for about two and a half hours. Then they would have to go through the process again. In the mid uh, 1980s, I had occasion to uh, be in the history room at the Sunco Library with Lloyd Fairfield. And he, uh, he, at that time, was writing Amanda's Poll, which he gave me a copy of later. Anything that you might add to that? I have, I've, I've read and tried to find, I've tried to figure out whether he had any evidence of African American presence actually on Negro Island. Um, I, I know, I can't, I haven't been able to find any, any suggestion of that, although that book does, does contribute to the notion that there was a good deal of discrimination and um, prejudice at the time, and you could understand why sea captains might be a little bit nervous about bringing their crew members, African-American crew members, into that kind of an atmosphere. Well, I do a corollary to that, too. Um, that, uh, he being the sage of software history, I was doing some writing and researching on a, uh, an ancestor, Lewis Whitney, who was killed in the wilderness. And I couldn't find some documentation. And so I asked him, uh, what do I do? What do I do here, Roy? He says, well, he says, with four little words, he says, I sometimes make it up 
<laughs> well, Amanda's code was made up. <laughs> well, that's, that was my point. <laughs> yeah, but, but I always think that there's probably a seed of truth in here sometimes. You got a question back here? Yeah. Um, Say that again. Can you speak at all to the relationship between Rhode Island Lighthouse and the Stone Marker on Stage Island? Which is two islands leading from Rhode Island? Yes. Um, yes. In 1821, a brig called the Hesper tried to make a passage between Negro Island and Wood Island. I don't have the chart up there anymore. But it's, I mean, it's about a foot deep even at high tide. And it went aground. Um, as a result of that, the captain, his name was Stevens, I believe, um, accused the Blunts, who were the editors of the Coast Pilot, which was the navigational aid at the time, of being uh, ambiguous about how to get from the open ocean into um, into Biddeford Pool. That argument went on for about three or four years, and eventually the government intervened and said we need to build a monument there. Not a monument per se, but what's called a day mark. It's basically a buoy on land. So that that, so that, that structure, that stone tower, is really an indication that here is Stage Island and this is this is the way to go. <laughs> Don't go that other way. I guess that's it. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. something about the island out there with the pyramid on it. Number one, that's a navigation aid. So if you're coming from the north and you're going into the outer harbor of Biddeford Pool, that marker tells you to keep that island on your right. Now if you're coming from the south, you're not going to come from the south. You have to come from the north or you come from the east. And then you keep that island on the right. And that's why it's in a pyramidal shape. Markers are either pyramidal, square, or rectangular. Now they're black. They're red, or they're numbered by either being odd or even. So that would be a right hand, so it would be even. It'd be, there's no numbers on it, so you can't do that. It's color, well they didn't color it, but it's shaped, so you can tell. There was, I don't think there was ever another accident like that again that happened in Bearford Pool. So, um, well, I want to thank you again for coming. This is the largest crowd I've had this year. And uh, thank you. Right. And if you might take time to think about becoming members of the Biddeford Historical Society. We have all kinds of other programs. We're on Facebook. We also are on our, on our uh, webpage. And we'd like to hear from you. Become a member, support us, and you will uh, hear more from us. The other thing is that we have cruises. Mike Massey has donated his vessel as Captain Mike Massey. So we are doing cruises again this summer that will leave here at the dock space in the middle of the river here and we'll make a trip out uptown and then out and around the island and then back to the dock space here at the, at the launch site, the state launch site. And we, it's in our website and uh, we love to have it. I know that we had a really wet show in last year of it and Captain Master's boat is the Marion B. Spell it right. All right, thank you. All right, appreciate you guys.